Good evening. I am Eden Durbin, and I'm Chief of Staff, our Delegate Jared Solomon. Thank you all very much for coming out and joining us this evening, because I know you want to be outside playing pickleball <laughs> and do not want to be in here. But thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate this. Um, before I begin, I want to introduce our team. Um, this is your D18 team. You have Senator Jeff Waltstriker. You have Delegate Aaron Kaufman. You have De Delegate Emily Shetty and Delegate Jared Solomon. And before we go further, I actually wanted to take a minute and um, recognize some other public officials and elected officials who've joined us this evening. Thank you very much. First, a real big thank you to uh, Mayor Tracy Furman, who has very generously offered us this space and set up all these chairs. Thank you very much. Um, Council Member Kate Stewart, who is here, come join us. Um, Town Council Member Connor Crimmins, there he is. Town Council Member Darren Bartram. Wonderful. And Town Council Member Ann Lichter. Ann, where'd you sneak into? Did I miss anybody? Terrific. Um, what we thought we would do this evening is um, have everybody from your team give an opening statement, maybe three to five minutes, give you an overview of a little bit about the legislation that they worked on and what passed, what didn't pass. Um, and then we would um, start in on some questions. Um, you'll know, we remember that when you signed in, you could submit some questions. So we picked out about, you know, 10 or 12 of them. Um, and I will call on those individuals who then can give their question. Um, we then will open it up to everybody um, who would like to ask a question. I know a couple of people have um, already approached me um, and asked to uh, ask their specific question. Um, so without further ado, um, let me start with um, Senator Jeff Waltstriker. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited. Thank you to the town council uh, for hosting us this evening, and thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, before we, we begin, I wanted to, to give council member Kate Stewart, our council member here in Kensington, a moment. Um, council member, if you want to use Eden's mic, um, many of you know council member Stewart and, um, uh, from her time as mayor of Tacoma Park. She now represents the Montgomery County Council on District 5, which now includes much of Kensington, most of Kensington. And so I'll turn it over to uh, Council Member Stewart. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here uh, this uh, evening with all of you. Um, we've been six months on the job uh, and I'm very much enjoying working with my colleagues and working with our rock stars in uh, Annapolis. I have to say that working with our state delegation has been terrific this last session and they will highlight many of the great things they've done. Um, just to let you know, um, I'm chairing right now the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee and I also serve on Transportation and Environment, but on the Council we work on all, a, a number of different issues. The big thing that we just wrapped up was our county budget um, and I'm happy to stay later and talk about that and not take away from anything from the state update. Um, just one highlight because I see La Laura Stewart was here. She's in the back. One really big highlight out of this budget cycle was um, what we did with our recordation tax. That's the tax you pay when you buy or sell your home. Um, we were able to actually uh, revise that so it's much more progressive and really the great news is that we were able to close the gap in our infrastructure projects which go to schools and transportation projects with this budget. And that was really important because that's gonna keep our school projects moving forward. And so that's, there's, there's a lot of coming out of our budget, but I do wanna highlight that and thank Laura Stewart and all the kids who worked on um, that. And like I said, I will stay for questions later. Thank you. Thank you. One more round of applause for Council Member Stewart. Thank you, Council Member. So we'll do quick introductions because then we want to get to your questions. Again, my name is Jeff Waldstriker. It's my honor to serve as your state senator um, and uh, just a privilege. Um, this legislative session, which we just completed, was uh, an incredible one, a productive one and a progressive one. 
And um, I'm in a little bit of a philosophical mood because yesterday, and this is a little bit why my, my voice um, is sketchy today. Yesterday I spent the day in St. Mary's City, which of course was the first city where the colony of Maryland was founded. And it reminded me that Maryland was born in progressivism. Maryland was born a unique state, a, a, a state different than the other colonies um, that were being settled at the time. Uh, Maryland was born as a state of religious tolerance um, by Catholics, by the Calvert family, the Lords Baltimore who were Catholic, um, but were nonetheless uh, close with the monarchy in England, which by then was um, uh, had turned into a Protestant monarchy, and uh, Maryland was founded as a place for religious liberty. And uh, not only was it a place for religious liberty, it was also a place that welcomed immigrants. Uh, Maryland was the first state, or really first colony, um, of the 13 colonies to naturalize foreign citizens. So if you came here from a different part of Europe, um, you could within a period of time and after um, an appeal to the state legislature, become a full-fledged legal member of the Maryland colony, uh, even if you weren't from England um, and even if you didn't speak any English. Um, and that was special to learn about. Um, as many of you know, Maryland was founded in a peaceful fashion, um, without violence uh, with the native population that was here uh, before English settlers, um, and with an exchange of goods that most people consider um, to this day to be fair, as opposed to other places where um, those exchanges or sales of land were, you know, would by today's standards be considered fraudulent or taking advantage of. Um, so Maryland's a special place, and, and we continue to kind of live by that mantra of progressivism, and this last legislative session definitely bears that out. And the reason that happened, let's be clear, was because we elected Governor Wes Moore as our new governor. And not only is he progressive when it comes to policy, he's also an inspiration to all of us in the legislature about what is possible and to be bold at every turn. And that's exactly what we were, we were bold. Um, so I'm gonna to touch on a few issues and you'll hear uh, from my colleagues on an, a number of other issues that were very important in this legislative session. Uh, let me start with abortion rights. Um, as you probably saw, um, other states throughout our union are making abortion laws incredibly strict. Um, some uh, banning abortion outright, some as early as six weeks. Um, and I think there was a case, I don't remember what state it came out of today, where um, one of these limitations was found to be unconstitutional. Um, Maryland is moving in the other direction and took dramatic steps forward. Uh, the first thing we did is um, we uh, passed a bill um, supporting constitutionalizing the right to choose in Maryland's state constitution. By law, that now means you as citizens will have uh, the final vote on this on your 2024 ballot, um, but we all approved it and did so um, by overwhelming margins. And so I'm proud that that's going in to our Maryland constitution with your support. And we also passed bills to ensure access on our college campuses so that people have uh, the right to reproductive freedom on our uh, public campuses. And then lastly, we ensured that the long arm of other states that are going the wrong way can't reach into Maryland. So that if there are doctors who are disciplined in other states for performing abortions here in Maryland, um, that that discipline is not reciprocal, um, that they can remain as doctors here in Maryland. And for people who travel from other states to obtain abortions in Maryland, uh, that they will be protected by Maryland law um, and not extradited to their home states uh, where abortion is uh, made illegal. And so those are big victories when it comes to reproductive freedom and personal bod bodily autonomy in Maryland. Uh, we also made real progress when it comes um, to cracking down on gun violence. Uh, this comes to my committee. We passed a three bill package, uh, one of which I was proud to author. And here's what those bills do. First, we pass a, a law called Jalen's Law. Uh, Jalen was a, a young woman, a teenager in uh, St. Mary's schools and was uh, murdered by a classmate who was also a teenager and had access to his parents' firearms because uh, they did not properly secure that firearm. And so we pass, a legis we pass legislation mandating that people secure their firearms so that they are unaccessible to children. We also made our licensing scheme more stringent. Uh, felons, those who are habitual drug users, alcoholics, uh, folks with mental illness who are also violent, um, should not have access 
to firearms or firearms licenses in the state of Maryland. Um, and we made those laws much more stringent, and I'm proud that we did so. Uh, finally, the case, uh, uh, there's a case called Bruin that the Supreme Court came down uh, with last summer in which they indicated it is constitutional and legal and acceptable for states to regulate sensitive places against firearms. Uh, this includes places like polling places, courthouses, legislative buildings, uh, and we made sure that that list uh, complied with Bruin and also made sure that uh, we were focusing on keeping people safe um, from, from firearms in sensitive places. Uh, that bill passed. I was uh, honored to be the, the author and lead sponsor of that bill and appreciate the support of my colleagues here uh, who helped move that bill forward in the House. Um, and so that's abortion and guns. And let me touch on one last issue before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, everyone here uh, on their last ballot voted on whether recreational cannabis should be legal here in Maryland. I'm a strong supporter of recreational cannabis. Um, that bill, uh, that, that um, ballot measure passed um, last November, I guess, and, but we needed legislation to implement that. And that's legislation we passed, a comprehensive omnibus bill passed uh, the, this past legislative session and will go into effect July 1. So that's now a month away. So in one month, cannabis will be legal here in Maryland and the places where you can now uh, purchase medical cannabis will be the first places that will sell recreational cannabis. Uh, and I'm proud that Maryland is moving in this libertarian direction. Uh, for those of you who are concerned about uh, driving while intoxicated um, or the use of uh, cannabis in like rental buildings and things like that, we can talk about that later, but I share many of those concerns um, and happy to address that with you. So I guess the, the buzzword is uh, with this new governor, with the Democratic supermajority and with the four members of the District 18 team you see up here, uh, we are moving uh, fast in a progressive direction uh, and I'm very proud that we're doing so. And with that, uh, I think we're gonna move alphabetically today. So let me kick it over to my colleague and my friend, Delegate Aaron Kaufman. Uh, thank you, and I just wanna, I, I just wanna make sure that um, my two more senior delegate colleagues don't want to go first, but uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Waldstriker. Uh, it, I, we have a long history together. Uh, back in 2006, this young man, all of 26 years old, knocked on my door telling me about how he just proposed to his girlfriend, uh, Joanna Stromberg, and how he was excited that she had said yes. And now three children later and 15 years later, uh, the, they're still kicking, fortunately. Um, but I, uh, so thank you, Senator Waldstriker. Um, I'm the newest member of the team, having wanted, uh, having the unenviable task of succeeding town of Kensington resident, uh, Al Carr, but I think I hit the ground running. I wanted to just talk about a few things that I'm proud that we accomplished um, together as a team. Um, the first bill that I am, got signed into law on May uh, 16th is a bill that really uh, helps families of students with disabilities. Because what it does is it says that if a school system, if a parent sues a school system over an IDEA violation, over a special ed violation, and they win, not only do they have to pay legal fees, we codified that portion of IDEA into Maryland law, but they also have to pay expert witness fees. And um, that is really critical because they typically run about $1,500 a day. So this will make it easier for parents of students with disabilities to advocate uh, for their children. Um, and I wanna thank my constituent, my friend Laura Stort for helping me um, on that bill. She gave some excellent testimony because we all know that it's a system that is rigged against uh, parents and I'm honored that 
Delegate Shetty and Delegate Solomon stood shoulder to shoulder with me on this issue uh, and were co-sponsors of the legislation. And it's unique in terms of Jeff, uh, Senator Waldstreicher was talking about Maryland's uniqueness. We only join, join two other states, the District of Columbia and the state of Delaware in requiring that school systems reimburse for expert witness fees if they lose. And I know that Delegate Shetty, Delegate Solomon, and I were very proud to vote for legislation that passed unanimously to shift the burden of proof for uh, in the in cases of special education disagreements from the schools uh, from the parent to the school system. To me, it's just an issue of fairness because the school systems have all the built-in experts and lawyers on hand. And I was uh, very glad that that shifting of the burden of proof passed 135 to nothing. It didn't pass the Senate, but uh, we'll keep at it. And beyond special education, I'm very proud of the fact that you know, I'm, I'm 36, and when I would tell some of my contemporaries and my friends about some of the Maryland laws that existed in terms of the, the work of the Judiciary Committee, they were appalled, and rightly so. So I was proud, proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, my colleague, Charlotte Crutchfield, in repealing the spousal defense for rape, because up until recently, when the governor signed the law, um, if a if a husband raped his or uh, his wife, he could not be charged with rape. And that's just really, really antiquated. So I was proud to stand with Charlotte to get that done. And Jeff is the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee. I was also very proud of legislation that repeals uh, the grounds for divorce by Vanessa Atterbury. Um, and w because if a previous to this, if it wasn't a mutual consent divorce, the, uh, the person that wanted to get divorced, if the other spouse was saying no, would have to demonstrate that their spouse committed adultery or they were abused, you know, like as in hit, uh, you know, so it was just a nightmare for families. And, you know, uh, so we made that easier. I'm also very proud that my colleagues and I stood with our friend C.T. Wilson to uh, give, uh, to increase uh, the statute of limitations by which a victim of child sex, ab uh, sex abuse can seek justice uh, from their abuser. And the last thing that I'll talk about is a bill that uh, passed at the 11th hour and uh, made the uh, Republicans a little cranky, but it's really important for racial equity reasons. And it, it's a bill uh, that was uh, sponsored again by Delegate Crutchfield. She had a very good session that um, says that police cannot stop someone solely based on uh, the possession, uh, the uh, not possession, so, uh, Blah, 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 blah. Uh, based solely on the odor of marijuana. And uh, that really has important racial equity components. And the governor let that become law without his signature recently. Uh, lastly, just because this is a municipality, I will say that I passed a law to, I mean, I, I sponsored a bill uh, that uh, would have enabled municipalities to uh, to purchase and maintain their own streetlights. And it passed the House on a bipartisan basis, but it did not pass the Senate. And uh, I want to just turn it over to my colleague, Delegate Chetty, but by saying that she and Delegate Solomon really uh, brought home the bacon. They're both on the Appropriations Committee. And, you know, in my house it's turkey bacon, but that's okay. Uh, but uh, anyway, they brought home for us $93 million for District 18 projects. So uh, we are so fortunate that they really know how to grease the wheels and bring home results for this community. So I'm going to now turn it over to my dear friend, Delegate Emily Shetty. Thank you, my friend Aaron. It's always so lovely to sit next to you. Um, I just want to take a moment to 
um, express uh, my gratitude to each of you for allowing us the opportunity to serve you as your uh, delegation in Annapolis. It really is an honor. Um, this is Delegate Solomon and I's second term, uh, so our fifth year, uh, fifth session, and uh, it really was an incredible one um, for all of the reasons that Senator Wallstriker shared and many more. Um, but one of the best parts um, is always, it's always sad when we, you know, we lose a teammate um, and Delegate Carr was a wonderful asset to our district and kept a really close uh, finger on the pulse on local municipal issues. And since our district has eight municipalities in it, that's a really, really critical role to play. Um, but I'll say that uh, Delegate Kaufman has been such a huge asset, not just to our delegation and our community as a whole, but to um, our uh, General Assembly. Um, so uh, as um, you may or may not know, but uh, Delegate Kaufman is the first, we believe ever, maybe nationwide, a per, uh, state elected official with a lifelong permanent physical disability. Um, and he has been a critical voice, not just for um, the disabled, um, but for, for so many issues already um, and bringing such um, uh, incredible commentary on the House floor that will literally shut down debates um, because uh, he just brings such brilliance to the table. So thank all of you for electing him uh, to join this team because um, so many, so many issues that uh, you know we're all really in the weeds on in Annapolis as your delegation, um, he has really been a champion on and so we're very lucky to have him there. Um, but I just wanna um, say also that this is an especially important time as we come out of the pandemic and we try and um, work towards solutions to bring um, bring uh, COVID learning loss uh, to an end, right? Like we have so many students fall behind uh, throughout the pandemic, but disproportionately so were, um, were those students who have disabilities and IEPs. And, um, and Delegate Kaufman has been an incredibly strong leader on, on this issue in particular. So I just wanna thank you, my friend, for all that you do. Um, So uh, I started off with my gratitude. I forgot to say my name, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm Delegate Emily Shetty. Um, I live in South Kensington, so just by the Mormon Temple in Rock Creek Hills. Uh, this is my fifth legislative uh, session that we've been through together. Um, I've had the uh, pleasure this session of serving in a couple of new roles uh, and on a new committee, which was uh, a very um, wonderful learning experience uh, that I got to, um, to, to spend um, with my, my wonderful friend here on my right, uh, Delegate Solomon. So for the first four years, I served on the House Judiciary Committee and I got to work very closely with Senator Waldstriker as he's on the sister committee in the Senate. Um, and uh, this year I was assigned to the House Appropriations Committee joining Delegate at Solomon. Uh, and you'd think that there are only two committees in Annapolis based on, <laughs> based on our um, assignments, but, uh, but we uh, really have the privilege of working on so many different issues in these capacities. But we also work, as you probably know, um, outside of our committees on lots of different legislation too. So um, in, uh, in Annapolis, it was my first year on appropriations, lots of learning, um, lots of uh, working towards um, uh, trying to find solutions on some of our big healthcare challenges in our state. Um, I serve on the, I now chair actually, the Health and Social Services Subcommittee, um, which includes our Medicaid budget, um, our um, human services budget, so temporary cash assistance, TANF, um, uh, SNAP, all of those funds run through our subcommittee, as does um, the housing, state housing funds that we run, work on. So um, really amazing opportunity to really dive in deep on the investments that our state is making to uplift families out of poverty. Um, and that has long been a focus of mine, improving our healthcare system and trying to get families out of poverty. So I'm really excited to get to work on that in this new role. 
Um, I also serve as the vice chair of the Montgomery County delegation, uh, through which I worked closely with our 26 members, 26, can you believe we're that big now? We're the biggest delegation in Annapolis um, and um, have some really incredibly talented legislators to boot. Um, and uh, worked uh, to, alongside our chair, Julie Polakovich Carr, uh, to advocate with um, House leadership for um, a number of different priorities that are really critical to the, uh, the Montgomery County uh, community. So um, through, through that work, uh, we were able to secure a lot of project funding for a number of majorly um, important, uh, both short-term and long-term projects and investments, uh, some of which are right here here in District 18, um, and so uh, very proud to have uh, to ad advocated for those projects uh, that I think uh, Delgate Salmon usually does a great job of detailing, so I might punt to him to do that again. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then also worked on a couple of pieces of legislation that um, I'm very proud uh, to say have passed, and a couple others that uh, we worked closely on with some constituents who are here in the audience, um, who will be working with again um, next session on on, on that legislation. So um, most of the bills I've worked on are focused in healthcare. Um, that was certainly true of uh, the, the bills that I worked on this year. I had one bill that uh, was um, kind of a repeat effort that we finally got to the finish line uh, that expands composting throughout the state by providing uh, farms an opportunity to accept um, food scraps from offsite um, for up to a certain limit um, to be able to process them safely, and then they can use it on the farm or eventually um, uh, go through the process of getting it certified to, um, to sell to the public. Um, but the farms are loving this uh, piece of legislation because they need the compost for their, for their, um, for their agricultural use, and, um, and it's probably one of the most popular bills I talk about with school kids um, because they all know what composting is, which is really fun. Um, so anyway, I look forward to chatting with you through your questions, and I will turn the mic over to Delegate Salmon. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Delegate Salmon. I'll just leave this here and I'm loud. Um, I, I just want to echo the, the thanks. Um, it's really an honor um, and truly humbling to get to represent our community in Annapolis. I think we have probably some of the smartest, most accomplished constituents, uh, not only in the state, but probably in the world. Um, and you all keep us on our toes, which we really appreciate. Um, and I want to echo the thanks to the folks from the town of Kensington. And I think council member Engel just walked in. So I think we have the entire council here. We could have a meeting afterwards, uh, we have full quorum. Um, and I also, I really want to thank my, uh, my chief of staff, Eden. Um, my name may be on the door, but I clearly work for Eden and any of you who have worked with us know that's true. Um, but our, the whole staff, Dave Kuhn's in the back and, and Kara with Cinder Wall Strikers team, um, um, it really is a collaborative effort, um, and none of what we were able to accomplish that we're going to talk about today would be possible without our incredible staff. Um, so I want to make sure I, I thank them. And, and again, thank you all for being here. Yeah. So, um, you know, as, as, as has already sort of been mentioned, it really was kind of a, a unique session, often the first year of a first term, especially with a new governor. You know, everybody's just sort of trying to figure out where, where is my office, where's the bathroom, how do things work here? Um, and that was not the case at all. Um, you know, the new administration really hit the ground running. We have incredible leadership um, in Speaker Jones and, and Senate President Ferguson, and we really used every minute of, of every day this session to make sure that we pass as many really good pieces of legislation as we possibly could. And, and Delegate Chetty is really humble. Um, she also was appointed as our House Caucus leader this year, um, which is just a testament to her kindness, her compassion, her, um, her knowledge of the state um, in that role. She's sort of responsible for being the liaison for every member of our caucus, which is what, 101? Yeah, 102. 102 or three. We picked up more members. It's a good problem to have. Um, and so, you know, that, that has been fantastic. And, and I took on a new role this session. Um, I was appointed by Speaker Jones to serve as the Deputy Speaker Pro Tem. Uh, so you've got a couple of folks in, in House leadership here who are part of Speaker Jones's leadership team, which is, is really exciting to get to, to bring the ideas that we get from all of you to the speaker directly and, and you know, to represent uh, our, our district um, fully before, before our caucus. Um, you know, so as, as um, Delegate Shetty mentioned, I'm really lucky to serve on the Appropriations Committee, um, and this is my fifth. This is my fifth session on the Appropriations Committee, and you know, I'm a big believer that it's great to talk about policy, but budgets, to me, are really where 
your priorities and your values come out. Because if you don't fund the policy that you talk about, it's just words on paper. Um, and this year in particular, where I think we were entering a period where it's not nearly as bleak as you know, some of the predictions were. It seems like every other turn when you open the newspaper, somebody's talking about the recession's coming tomorrow um, or next week. But it certainly wasn't like it's been in the last year or two where we had all this federal money and surpluses were just kind of raining in. And it's obviously a lot easier to spend a surplus than it is to, to cut a deficit. So with that, first and foremost, we tried to be incredibly fiscally prudent. Um, and so I want to give you just some highlights of the budget. And I'm going to start with the fact that we actually set aside almost $3 billion in reserves, which is actually more than we have a, an entity called the Spending Affordability Committee that sort of sets the parameters for the budget. Um, it's made up of members of the General Assembly and members of the public. And we actually exceeded the target that the Spending Affordability Committee set out for savings into the rainy day fund and in the general fund. So we want to make sure that if we do hit a recession, and you know, the, the numbers aren't as good as they've been, that we have the funding to make sure that we're able to continue to support all the investments that make Maryland the place that it is. So that, that's first and foremost. And then what did we actually spend our money on? So you know, we talked about the importance of education, the blueprint for Maryland's future. We set aside an additional $900 million to fully fund the blueprint. And part of the reason we needed more money is because the blueprint changes the way that we identify children living in poverty can now do it using Medicaid as, as a proxy. So we had a lot more children that we knew, frankly, were, were in need. We just weren't counting them right. And so when we came into this legislative session, we found out we were probably about a billion dollars short um, because we had, I think, almost 110,000 more students who we identified as, as being in need, living in poverty, than we had the year before. Again, they were there already. We just weren't counting them, and we weren't investing in them. And so this year, we made a commitment. The governor, I think, put $500 million in the budget. Our committee, working with the Senate, put an additional $400 million in because there is no better place to invest our money for the future of our state than in making sure that we have the best schools, not just in the country, but in the world. Um, and so that was first and foremost. Um, you know, Building on that, we increased investments in community college and our four-year system by 11%. Um, one of the bills that I was most proud of, of being able to get through uh, into the governor's desk this year was an, uh, a huge overhaul of our financial aid and state grant system, um, including uh, decentralizing our community college promise program, the, essentially our free community college program. And so that means essentially we're going to double the amount of funding that's available for free community college and decentralize it from a state bureaucracy that frankly was not working and put a lot of barriers in place to our students to have it run out of each individual community college so they can target their students, they can, you know, we have some, some colleges where they're educating thousands of students and they were literally giving out 350 of these grants a year um, because of all the paperwork burdens and the barriers that were in place. So that means Montgomery College is going to see double the amount of state grant money that they were receiving before and we are going, we dramatically eliminated the barriers for our state grant program that allows low-income students to essentially get a full scholarship to a, a university system school, public school in the state to allow those students who we hope come out of a really great K-12 system, go to college in Maryland, and then stay in Maryland and stay here for a lifetime. Um, so that was, that was really significant. In other parts of the budget, um, you know, we, we made sure that we invested in our public workforce. We have vacancy rates in, um, you know, in some of our state agencies as high as 30 or 40 percent. Our medical examiner's office was literally on the verge of being decertified because of their vacancy levels. Um, and that was probably one of the, the least reported aspects of, of the previous administration was just sort of a hollowing out of state government. And, and I know we've worked with a lot of our constituents who can't get the services they need because there aren't staff and there aren't people doing the jobs that, that frankly we need them to do. And so this was a top priority for, for Speaker Jones. Um, and we made sure that we delivered. And the governor set a big goal of essentially having the vacancy rate in his first year. So even if we don't get to that big goal, even if we reduced it by 30%, it would be a tremendous, tremendous improvement in the level of services that you all um, would see and, and so that we can protect our environment, that we can keep our communities safe. Um, in terms of local investments, you know, Delegate Shetty mentioned the incredible team that we have um, in our delegation leadership. That translated into an 8% overall increase in funding back for Montgomery County in the state budget. And so what did that look like? That looked like an additional $71 million for the actual operations of our schools to MCPS, and an additional $84 million in capital dollars to be able to, as, as Councilmember Stewart mentioned, fully fund our school capital budget, which is so critical. 
Um, and then we brought money back for bus rapid transit. Um, we had guaranteed a funding stream in last year's, uh, last year's legislation uh, in 2022. And this year we went back and guaranteed that the county essentially could bond that money. Um, so that's hopefully going to supercharge the construction of the bus rapid transit lines along uh, 355, along Veers Mill, and some of the, the future lines that are planned that are so important to um, our county's economic development goals. And then locally, you know, we brought back money for um, the Institute for Health Computing, which could be, frankly, the biggest economic engine um, that this county has seen in, in decades. That's going to be just right up the road in, uh, in North Bethesda um, at the uh, sort of big 16-acre vacant lot that's right above the formerly White Flint, now North Bethesda Metro Station. If you're going north on Pike and Rose, it's on the east side. Um, and it's deceptively small, but it's actually 16 acres. It's going to um, also bring with it a second metro entrance. And what this, this institute will be is essentially a partnership between the University of Maryland for their AI um, and supercomputing powers with the University of Maryland Medical System, University of Maryland Baltimore County, uh, Bowie State University, and then the universities at Shady Grove are going to run the internship programs. And essentially, you know, the best example I would give is instead of you know, when you have a drug trial using a wet lab or human subjects to test the, dr the, the drug, you can model and essentially advance so much of that work through supercomputers and AI. Um, and so we are going to be on the cutting edge of using supercomputing technology and AI to further healthcare. Um, they already have two of the you know, world's foremost experts uh, there anchoring the institution. It's going to be at Pike and Rose um, while this building is completed. And we hope essentially it's going to bring more actual square footage of, of economic development than the Amazon HQ2 headquarters would have been, and certainly with a lot fewer tax breaks. Um, so, and these are jobs that are going to be, you know, literally family sustaining, you know, high quality jobs that will last a lifetime that people will move to this county. Um, and we think could also bring the, the federal government's ARPA-H, which is sort of the advanced research hub focused on healthcare. Um, and that's all going to be right up the road. So we were singularly focused on bringing resources back for the infrastructure of that, while also bringing money for the university system to be able to anchor an incredibly important flagship uh, institution right here in Montgomery County and in District 18. Um, and then on the local piece, you know, uh, Delegate, Delegate Kaufman mentioned we did bring home the bacon. Um, and some of the, the local projects that we really fought hard to get funded, several local parks, um, the Dalewood Park, uh, further up Connecticut Avenue, Wheaton Forest Local Park. Um, we brought a million dollars back for a uh, future planned Wheaton Arts Center, money for the, for the Roundhouse Theater, for the Bethesda Women's Market uh, over on uh, Wisconsin Avenue to create six new acres of, of parkland to underground those parking, uh, parking lots and really create tremendous green space in Bethesda. Um, and, you know, we fully funded uh, the Montgomery Hills redesign, uh, which actually was literally highlighted in Governor Moore's budget. Um, so that is the 50-year progress uh, that we were able to accomplish um, to reimagine that whole stretch of road from 16th Street to Forest Glen to create, you know, a complete street, open that up to development, and really, really bring home the gateway to Silver Spring um, for what, what the community really deserves. Um, Lastly, I'll just mention uh, a couple of the bills that I was really proud of. I mentioned the, the higher ed bill. One of the other bills that we were able to, to get uh, to the governor's desk with Senator Gazzoni um, was a bill to fully fund the Maryland Meals for Achievement program. Uh, I started my career as a high school teacher, still work in education, and it's really important to me that we, we get our students the support they need. Um, and so what this bill will do is fully fund essentially universal breakfast. If you have a school that's below a certain or above a certain threshold of, of students living in poverty, every student can qualify to essentially get uh, a free meal. Nobody's got to set anything aside. And we had a wait list of about 250 schools because we didn't fund it enough. And so this year, we fully funded it. So that means next year, more than, I think it's, I have it here, 180,000 potential new students will have access to healthy breakfast for free in the morning. And we know how that important it is. Um, and then lastly, the, the one bill that actually did not pass, um, we were able to get it out of the house. Um, I worked in, in partnership with, uh, with my colleague, the chair of the Economic Matters Committee, C.T. Wilson, was a bill to create uh, an age-appropriate design code to really tackle a lot of the uh, harms that we know um, young people experience online and social, on social media and just general data management practices on the internet. Um, you know, the Surgeon General recently released a warning basically saying, you know, our, our, our young people probably should not be on social media. It's not good for them. And we know we're dealing with a mental health crisis. And so we worked with um, several national experts. Um, we were able to get the bill out of the house. We 
came up a little bit short in the Senate, um, but I think we're going to be in a really good place with it next year. And it would make Maryland only the second state in the country to tackle essentially online data privacy for, for young people, making sure that, that it, the internet is a safe, as safe a possible space for our young people as it can be. And, and we got a lot of tremendous support from, from young people and, and families in the community and really excited to bring that bill back next year. Um, and so just really excited to take your questions and I'll turn it back over to, to Eden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to call on a couple of people who had submitted questions through the form. Um, and Miranda, I think I will start with you if that is all right. You can go ahead and use my microphone. Thank you so much. And thank you, representatives, for taking the time to come and speak with us. Um, I am asking on behalf of my niece, Natalie, who is a trans elementary school student. Um, I am genuinely terrified for her safety. Um, I realize that in a place like Montgomery County and in Maryland that we're probably safe enough, but just hearing all of the hatred and vitriol and harmful legislation that is being passed in other states and is being talked about on the federal level, I genuinely don't know if she's going to be able to continue to exist as she is in who she is meant to be as she gets older. And so I'd love to hear from any or all of you how you are going to prioritize not just trans health care in the state of Maryland, but especially trans health care for young people. Thank you. I'll start with that. First of all, thank you, Miranda, um, for sharing your niece's story. And what's going on in, around this country is truly abhorrent. But that's why it's such a blessing to live in the state of Maryland with um, these three wonderful teammates and our talented um, progressive, uh, progressive governor. Because while other states were passing abhorrent laws and engaging fear in fear-mongering and othering of transgender individuals, uh, I, along with uh, Delegate Solomon, uh, Delegate Shetty, and Senator Waldstrike are partnered with our teammates, uh, Delegate Ann Kaiser and Senator Mary Washington of Baltimore City, to pass the Transgender Health Equity Act. And it wasn't uh, easy because of all the fear-mongering that you should have heard on the House floor. But because we stood firm, because we knew the cause was just, um, we passed a, a bill that, among other things, uh, said that people on Medicaid, just like people in, who are on commercial insurance in our state, can get gender-affirming care. We also said that, um, that it, people could not interfere with the uh, patient a doctor relationship as they were discussing potential you know uh, treatments related to gender dysphoria we also said that health care could not be denied to anyone based on their gender identity and we uh, we also really worked hard uh, um, so this was at a time where they were passing all these laws, Maryland was in the lead. And then, you know, Delegate Solomon talked about how um, he was disappointed that his social media bill um, didn't pass. And we had a disappointment in the trans space as well, because our friend and colleague, Delegate Leslie Lopez of Germantown, um, tried to get a bill uh, for transgender inmates uh, so that uh, guards could not discriminate against uh, transgender individuals, um, that the inmates could be housed in the uh, section of the jail aligned with their gender identity. And unfortunately, uh, that didn't make it through, but I do want to commend Delegate Solomon for co-sponsoring the legislation. Both Delegate Shetty and I had COVID that week, so we couldn't co-sponsor it, but our hearts were in the right place. Um, so blame it on the Paxlovid that our name wasn't on there. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so I'm very proud to be in Maryland which is pushing against the tide uh, that's coming across the country. So I hope that answers your question. Um, feel free to come to speak with me afterwards if you need. 
Thank you. Um, is there an Eva tool in the audience? Um, do you want to quickly give an update on the summit and Warner, or should we come back to that at the end? We'll just come back to it. Okay. Um, how about an Eleanor Dougherty? All right. Um, Barbara Lovitz. Good evening, and thank you for holding this forum. Um, in light of the train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, a few months ago, I'm curious as to whether the trains that come through the county on the CSX line carry hazardous wastes, and if so, what safety measures are in place? Yeah, Barbara, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so the question was about you know the, the train derailment in East Palestine and what, what that means potentially for trains that run through here. The unfortunate answer, to be honest with you, is much of the freight rail systems in this country are essentially governed by federal statute. Um, and much of what we do or attempt to do at the state level is ultimately superseded by federal regulation. And for any of you who are lawyers, the federal railroad statutes go back like literally 150 years um, and are very arcane um, and are very, very difficult for the state to sort of break into. We run into a lot of those issues, frankly. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the other issues that I spent a lot of time on is, is working on our MARC rail system. And many of our MARC trains share tracks with CSX, um, specifically, obviously, in our community on the Brunswick line. But what I will say is one of the bills that we did pass um, that I was very proud of and I know uh, we all supported was a bill to require uh, essentially a two-man crew um, that requires that there have to be at least two engineers on every train to make sure if, God forbid, something happens to somebody, um, you know, that, uh, that somebody is there in, in that instance to take over and make sure that the train is being operated safely. I will say that one of the, the really important pieces to having our state government fully funded and our state workforce fully intact is that we have really important oversight roles to play um, and making sure that we have environmental regulators who are checking and working that we have, uh, you know, one of the things I will say, again, on the mark rail front, we, uh, one of the bills that, that I passed in, in 2022 really dealt with advancing and, and uh, building out our mark rail infrastructure. And one of the reports that we got back as part of the bill showed us that literally two thirds of the people who work for mark essentially in the Maryland Transit Administration were contractors. There were no people in the Mark office whose job it was to long-term plan and think about long-term infrastructure issues. Um, and so that's really concerning. You know, the, the Maryland Department of Transportation, we were just with, uh, we were with the secretary earlier this afternoon, has been sort of hollowed out. And so when we think about a lot of these issues, even if we can't necessarily pass a regulation because we'll be superseded again by, by Washington, um, having those regulators and those, that oversight on the ground makes such a huge difference, um, especially in our relationship with CSX and making sure that, that we are safe. And if I could, uh, Delegate Solomon was very modest, but in terms of the personnel that, and the vacancies that he keeps speaking of, um, our dear friend Delegate Solomon was recently named chair of the personnel committee. Uh, so he will be in a position um, to be the prime advocate to fill those vacancies. So I want to congratulate him on this prestigious appointment. Thank you. Um, Teresa Intrader. Teresa, are you with us this evening? Um, how about um, Maya Teitelbaum? All right. Um, okay, Joel, um, I've given them a briefing on your issue, so you can just um, summarize. Sorry about the mask. I uh, was exposed, but I'm clean. I don't have COVID. Uh, I, I wanted to... Uh, okay, I wanted to thank you all for uh, appropriating the funds for the various parks uh, improvements in Montgomery County and other places, I hope because the parks have been neglected. They have been uh, allowed to degrade and deteriorate over many years. And it's a great time to refresh them, to uh, improve them, and to bring them back to nature, if I can put it that way, because even the trees are falling down due to toxic uh, uh, plants and, 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 and various other types of uh, neglect. So what I would like to ask you to do is to follow up on your appropriation with the planning agencies. In this case, uh, Montgomery County, it's uh, the Montgomery Parks, 
which has a planning uh, department, which is uh, located, co-located with the, the uh, Montgomery County uh, Planning Department up in Wheaton, in the new building, and seems to have adopted some of the, uh, how shall I call it, top-down approaches that the planning de uh, the board under the former, now disgraced, uh, planning board chair uh, uh, put in place, which means that they don't talk to the local communities, the neighbors, the park users. They just bring in what they want to do, and they want to use your appropriated money for that purpose first and worry about getting ADA access and, and trails some other way. And that really bothers us. We'd appreciate your help. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Joel. And, and what Joel was referring to in particular, um, last year, I think as many of you may remember, there was the, the really unfortunate explosion at the Friendly Gardens apartment in, in Lintonsville and Silver Spring. And so it was already sort of on our list of, of projects to, to fight for for funding, um, was an, uh, a complete refresh of the Lintonsville Rosemary Hills Park um, behind the Cofield Center. Uh, and I want to recognize, I see Pat Tyson in the back there, appreciate her decades of advocacy um, and, and stewardship in that community. But we were able to get the full $800,000 that the Parks Department asked for last year. Again, we really wanted to make sure that that community was as supported as possible after that explosion. And, and Joel, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking to Parks later this week to make sure they're taking the community's input into account. And um, anybody is here from that community, the survey, the online survey that Parks has put together runs until, I think, the close of, uh, close of midnight. Oh, closed already. I thought it was the 31st. I didn't know when they closed it. But there's a community walkthrough with the parks um, department on Saturday from I think two to four um, that many of us will be there so thank you Joel um, Lynn Weinstein Linda Wilson Brian um, um, Blumenreich and Deborah Tukat and John Villamerit um, I know that there's nope. two other. Is it? Did I miss it? Yeah. I think Melvin was just raising his hand for one thing. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay. I've got two individuals that approached me um, early on, so I wanted to give them an opportunity. Um, Kathy, did you want to um, say something about um, marijuana? <laughs> Hi, my name is Kathy Lyle. I live in Rock Creek Gardens Condominium in Silver Spring. So. I'm concerned about recreational marijuana, and the reason I am concerned about it is people living in multifamily housing units have no recourse. Um, in our condominium, I, I know because I'm president of the, the, the board, we have complaints about marijuana smoking. Even before the law passed, when there was an incident of where people smell, smelled marijuana, the police wouldn't come. They said it's too low level. We were supposed to call them if we knew that they were dealing. And I ask you, I know some of you have kids. Would you expose your kids to marijuana or cigarette smoking in your home? We, people who in multifamily housing units do not have a choice. Now you say, well, okay, why well, live in a HOA? Why not change the bylaws? That's very difficult to do. Um, and to get even the number of people to, to vote is difficult. Um, even if we did um, uh, make that change, who's going to enforce it? Police aren't going to come because it's now legal. So I, w I know I have emailed your offices, except for Delicate Kaufman, because I started this back in October before he, he was elected. And the answer was, we'll talk to the sponsor of the bill. I'm really concerned about this. And is there something that the General Assembly, you guys, can do? Well, thank you for the question, and, and it's a good one. Um, this was something the legislature really struggled with this year, this issue of multifamily housing and how that interfaces with cannabis. Um, I have three children, and um, I wouldn't want them to be exposed to cannabis odor over the long term. 
Um, and, um, but I think where we landed, and I know this is unsatisfactory to you, is that we will allow individual buildings to make their own decision. Um, but I encourage you to, um, these uh, HOA rules um, are contracts that can be brought to court like any other contract matter. And so I encourage you, if you are concerned about if you're able to change the bylaws and then those bylaws change and people continue to violate those bylaws, uh, to use our court system as uh, anyone might to enforce uh, the rules of the contract because the contract is between the members of the HOA or the ma members of the condo association. Um, and so that's, that's where we landed. I guess I would just say on a macro level, um, so uh, uh, we legalize alcohol, re-legalize alcohol um, at the end of prohibition and, and, and with a constitutional amendment. Um, and here we are almost 100 years later, every year our legislature continues to get bills related to the sale and use of alcohol. And so this legalization on July 1st is the beginning not the end. And just as we come back each and every year to deal with new issues related to alcohol regulation, so do I imagine we will be back each and every year uh, for nuanced issues that come with the legalization of cannabis. So thank you for your question. Um, well, I have one other individual and then I will be happy to call on you. Um, John List, did you have a question about solitary confinement? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the work that you've done. I'm currently the chair of Interfaith Action for Human Rights. We, in coalition with the Maryland Alliance for Justice Reform, various disability groups, have a focus on improving solitary confinement as it's handled in the Maryland state prison system. And I know with your backgrounds in judiciary proceedings, judiciary committees, and that sort of, this is not a new issue. I would just like to hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. Well, first, sir, let me um, preface my remarks with the fact that I'm not one of the lawyers at the table. Dele uh, Senator Waldstriker and Delegate Shetty are lawyers, not me. Uh, but uh, what I would say is, you know, I didn't take on the law school debt. What can I say? Uh, but uh, my point, uh, but my point is uh, that I'm very aware of this bill, and I think my colleague, uh, the new vice chair of the Judiciary Committee, I think it was one of her bills to um, uh, to limit solitary confinement to 15 days, and. Uh, 15 days or something like that. And it didn't get anywhere. And it leads me to a broader point because I want to go back to Miranda's question at the um, outset of the evening. If you guys believe in this, uh, these progressive values as we do, um, please let us know because I was, I'm always committed to, for example, to standing shoulder to shoulder with the uh, transgender community but I got far more emails asking me, Delegate Kaufman, please oppose uh, HB 283, the Trans Equity Act. And you know there was very strong opposition to the so Delegate Bartlett's solitary confinement bill. So if there's one thing that you can uh, take away from this evening is please get in touch with us because I find um, the people that oppose our progressive values are much better at emailing us than, and sometimes we need the moral support because we have to take, um, you know, we get a lot of nasty mail about, you know, with uh, fears about trans uh, issues or, you know, you're letting the criminals run wild or something, so please back us up. Um, but yes, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, my parents always told me, if you, at first you don't succeed, try and try again, and we will continue to try. I'm Delegate Bartlett's tenacious, and I'm sure she'll continue to w try on that issue. John, one of, the, one of the things I wanted to add, um, it's not directly related to solitary confinement, but it's an issue that I know your organization probably worked on and a lot of advocates in Montgomery County worked on, was um, getting finally fully funding, not only passing it, but then getting it fully funded for a women's pre-release center. 
Um, and that was something, uh, so some of you may, may not know, that we have pre-release centers around the state, but there is no pre-release center that was specifically dedicated for women, um, which is essentially a step down facility that allows um, inmates to sort of transition back into, into life. It's a great way to make sure that, that there is less recidivism um, as we talk about crime issues, making sure that folks can re-enter society after paying their debt um, and, and live a, a safe and productive life. Um, and so we passed legislation that was championed by one of our other colleagues from Montgomery County, Delegate Crutchfield, fought the previous governor literally tooth and nail over the bill, finally got it through. We put money in the budget. He basically ignored us. He said, I'm not going to spend it. I'm not going to do it. And so, um, you know, I, I was lucky to serve on the capital budget committee this year. Um, and we made a very public show of, with our, our new um, our new secretary to make sure that not only did they understand, because a lot of her staff has been sort of held over from the previous administration, that business as usual is not going to be tolerated, but we added an additional $2 million of, of money from our committee. Um, we had new budget authority this year, um, and we were able to, to add money to the budget. We made sure that not only was the $3 million there that had been put in by the governor, but the additional $2 million to fully fund the construction and completion of the pre-release center, as well as several parameters that are going on the Department of Corrections to make sure that they are providing like literally quarterly reports to the committee um, so that we can make sure that they're doing it properly, that, that the bill that many of our advocates worked so long and hard on and that, that frankly inmates around the state deserve um, gets, gets fully funded and implemented. I just want to add something really quick, um, not to belabor this issue, um, but uh, during my time on the Judiciary Committee, during one of the interims, our committee was uh, invited to do a tour of some of our prison systems throughout the state. And as you can imagine, uh, during these types of tours where, you know, just like each of us, you know, when we have guests come over, we kind of like tidy up the areas that, you know, they're going to come see, right? Uh, this was very much the case when we went uh, to visit. They had, you could literally smell fresh paint along the carefully choreographed path we were walked on. You could see and smell fresh mulch, you know. It was very, like, obvious what had been done. Um, despite that, uh, we did tour one of the solitary confinement facilities during which it was a very hot day. It was very hot. Um, outside was sweltering. Inside the building that had no AC, uh, they had giant fans, um, and they, they were loud, loud giant fans, and they pointed all of them at us on, like, the little walkway we would stand on in this residential facility. And the purpose of doing that was to drown out the screaming that um, was coming from the um, inmates that were there. Um, I don't think I will ever unsee or unhear or unfeel um, that that experience. It was incredibly, incredibly um, eye-opening, to say the least. And uh, while we don't often hear a lot about um, criminal justice reform issues um, in our district, it's not one of the top issues we hear about. We often hear from folks about pedestrian safety and um, you know, investments in our parks and trans health is really important and we hear about a lot of different issues, but this is not one of the top, top issues that we hear about. And nonetheless, I think it is extra important for all of us to be aware of um, how people in our state are being treated still today. And um, I just want to share that there, there was a bill, I believe it was referred for summer study, um, Perhaps our, our wonderful vice chair of JPR might be more familiar with the details now that I'm not on that committee, I'm less familiar. Um, but I just wanna thank those who are advocating um, outside of Annapolis for these reforms because they're really incredibly important. Um, it, it, it's, it's really easy to dismiss people who have, have made poor choices uh, when you don't know what led them to make those choices. Um, but, but they're still humans, and um, we have to remember that, that the way that we as a society are treating all people is critical, especially those who are behind the wall. So thank you for your advocacy. Yes, why don't you introduce yourself and then ask a question. Thank you, Melvin Sachs. Um, you know, with the very conservative Supreme Court and Maryland legislature, and Maryland state introducing very, you know, fairly progressive uh, environmental uh, gun safety provisions. I imagine the two might clash in the sense that, uh, you know, some of the bills that have passed 
and been signed might conflict with what the Supreme Court would allow because of the Second Amendment. And I mean, how do you feel about the resolution of that? And then just the second question, real quick. Um, I'm in favor of the of the uh, uh, the purple line, and I'm just waiting for it to be completed. And <laughs> just any information on that? Yeah. Can I just say something yeah, really please. quick? So, so half of the folks here at this table are lawyers. All four of us are legislators, um, and we're very proud of the work we do as the legislative branch in Maryland to advocate for the people. Uh, none of us are judges, and uh, not all of our work will get to the Supreme Court. Uh, much of our work will not, um, and will stand on its face. Um, and um, you know, until. Uh, a bill uh, gets to that level, I don't think anybody can really guess uh, which way something might go. On the Bruin um, uh, decision and the, the legislation that was passed in response that Senator Wallstreicher was an incredible leader on, you know, this is an area of the law that has not yet um, really been fully explored at the Supreme Court level. You have two uh, amendments or two, two bill, um, amendments to the Constitution that speak to two different provisions, right? The right over your own personal property and to, to make fundamental determinations over what you allow for in your own space, in your own home, and the Second Amendment. And these two have not been fully adjudicated. Um, and so, um, you know, we're proud and confident in the work that we did. And, um, and I think that, you know, we'll have a great attorney general um, who can back us up. But I will uh, let others share their views as well. Can I just say something really quick? Um, thank you. I just wanted to say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sachs, uh, that your uh, Delegate Shed is correct. We're not judges, but we have to try. And I just want to say that my chairman, uh, Luke uh, Clippinger of Baltimore, um, crafted HB 824, which is part of the um, which is part of the um, gun package that Senator Waldstriker talked about, based on the concurrences of Justice Kavanaugh and Justice uh, Roberts, uh, um, in, uh, in both of whom are residents of D District 18, by the way, we're honored to represent them. But- uh, they, they skipped our town. But, uh, <laughs> but the fact is that I know, uh, you know, I, I know that Chair Clippinger uh, on his bill did try to craft it in a way that was compliant with the concurrences by Justices Kavanaugh and Roberts. So I have, well, I'm not a lawyer. I have great faith in my chairman that he, and in Senator Waldstriker, that he crafted legislation, they, both excellent lawyers, um, that they crafted legislation that will pass uh, constitutional muster, but we'll see. Oh, purple line? Oh. Oh, we all, we are all really excited for the opening of the purple line as well. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, we, um, I, I actually am going to be serving on a, a new committee um, within appropriations, the Transportation and Environment Committee. Um, even though I was on the Education and Economic Development Committee prior to that, I often spent a lot of time, particularly on purple line, working with, he's now, he's now moved over to become the, the chair of the, of the full Transportation and Environment Committee, um, one of our big standing committees, but Delegate Corman, who represents our, our neighbor district, was the chair of that subcommittee on appropriations, and he and I worked hand in glove on a lot of issues, and Purple Line Oversight was one of them. We're very excited that it'll finally get open. I think what we're, what we're pivoting towards now, as I think a lot of the sort of bigger issues with the new contractor have been put to the side, and now it's just a matter of getting the work actually done, is making sure that the infrastructure is available for people to be able to get to the Purple Line stations. And, and I know working with, um, with Council Member Stewart and folks at, uh, at Montgomery County Department of Transportation, as well as the State Highway Administration, that we've got sidewalks and complete streets and areas so that because there obviously isn't going to be parking at Purple Line stations that people can, can bike and walk and get to the station safely. Um, and as still a top priority for us is to make sure that we follow through on the commitment that we got from the previous contractor that the trail, the Capitol Crescent Trail, would open when the construction is actually complete. Because the line, once the construction is done, there's going to be nine to 12 months of testing of the train line itself where we should be able to use the trail. And that was a commitment we got from the CEO of the previous contractor. And um, we're trying to get the same commitment from the new administration as well. So we're, we're staying on them. 2026, I think, yeah. Ooh, that's a hand. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you state your name. Thank you, 
Leslie Freed, and thank you all for coming here and for representing us um, in, in Annapolis. We're really proud to have you all as our representatives. I have two unrelated questions, so bear with me. One has to do with the Medical Aid and Dying Act, which doesn't seem to get through much of anything, and I guess what your you think your prospects are in Maryland. I mean, we can drive one mile to the D.C. border and, you know, go through a lot of rigmarole to actually take advantage of having a death with dignity and painless or move to, or go to Vermont. We don't even have to move there. Um, so that's one question. The second has to do with, and Emily, this may be something for you, because I think something really important, a basic human right is affordable housing. And it's such a big issue, not only in Montgomery County, but in Maryland. So could you all address, do we have funding appropriations? Do we have a strategy in Maryland? Because people are not going to get lifted up out of poverty if they don't have a safe um, place to live. And that's not only families, it's older adults as well. Thank you. Well, Leslie, thank you for both of those questions. And, and I'll, I'll take the first one, but, um, but, but tell you how much I support uh, a comprehensive plan for affordable housing. You'll hear from Emily um, on that issue. Um, on the issue of death with dignity, medical aid in dying, um, this is legislation that um, I anticipate will pass next year. Um, I'm honored to be uh, the author of that legislation. We've got supporters of that bill uh, on the team here. Um, this year was a challenge because of so much we were doing that you've heard about already today on abortion rights, on gun issues, on environmental protection. And unlike Congress, which is essentially always in session, we are a part-time legislature that has to fit everything within 90 days, um, and it moves fast. Um, and crossover day, which is an insidery term for like when everything has to pass internally is a month before the end of session, so it's really 60 days. Um, that's a lot um, to do so many of these big things. And it was just a real challenge this year to educate so many new members on the policy behind the Death with Dignity Bill. I think, I think we have the votes and I think we have the empathy of so many legislators who support this important issue and view it as I do as an issue of bodily autonomy. Um, and that's why I kind of combine it with the issue of reproductive freedom, which is really on people's minds right now. Um, but just because you support the idea of um, allowing people to make choices at the end of life doesn't mean you necessarily know exactly what's in the legislation, which is many, many pages. And people deserve the right to kind of educate themselves um, on uh, exactly how the bill works and how what's happening in the, in the other states that you mentioned. Um, so I think you'll see the bill come back next year. Um, and I think you, you'll see a lot of momentum behind the legislation. So thank you for that question. And I'll, I'll speak uh, to the affordable housing issue. Um, and thank you, Leslie, for those great questions. It's good to see you. Um, so, uh, so housing policy um, is sort of one of those interesting areas similar to education policy that is funded at the federal, state, and local level. Um, and our council has done an exceptional job of putting in a lot of resources, thank you, um, into the budget to address uh, things like affordable housing development as well as um, emergency rental assistance. Our state has done some work in this space as well and at the local level is really where you see a lot of the planning happening for where things are going to go, who's going to develop, all of that happens at the local level. Uh, the state is really involved too. Um, so, you know, just uh, recently we were all together at um, a, um, a brand new, um, uh, like a, not a ribbon cutting, but like a groundbreaking, thank you, um, for a brand new affordable housing development uh, that is gonna be about um, half a block north of the Forest Glen Metro. So transit accessible, uh, walkable, um, they are, uh, they, they, uh, that is like a, a, a property that was purchased that is going to triple the amount of 
affordable housing in that one location uh, from what was existing there before. Um, obviously, this is not enough to meet our housing needs across the county or state, um, but the state, the counties across the state are all working really closely on this issue in particular and putting the, months, uh, the, the money behind it to, to make things happen. Thank you. Um, the only two things I wanted to, to add, Leslie, to the, the last question. Um, you know, Delegate Shetty mentioned the sort of writ large work that we do at the state level um, with the state budget that provides a lot of the amazing resources that our incredible partners locally are able to take advantage of. But it's also really important for us when we're thinking about the projects that we're able to fund locally um, and sort of the things we go to bat for, um, you know, to leadership and, and within our committee for Delegate Chetty and I, it's really important for us to think about how we can help those kind of projects get off the ground. And so I wanted to recognize Alan Goldstein, who is doing amazing work um, with AHC, local Kensington resident. And so we were able to bring, was it $500,000 last year to close a little bit of a gap funding for an amazing project that they're doing on, uh, on Randolph Road at the old, the old Roundhouse Theater site. Um, it's gonna be not only affordable units, but they're partnering with Habitat for Humanity to provide, is it 25 sale units through Habitat? But we also then this year, we're able to bring money back to help them uh, fund a childcare center that's gonna go in there. So not only is it gonna be affordable housing on a transit line, soon to be a bus rapid transit line as well, um, but we're also gonna provide wraparound support services there, including affordable childcare. And so that's really, really critical to us. And then there was a great bill that um, two of our colleagues, uh, neighboring districts, Delegate, um, Delegate Stewart and Delegate Wilkins, put forward that we passed this year was to create uh, uh, essentially a rental assistance fund for folks who are waiting for their Section 8 voucher, which is a federal program. And once you've been approved for that, obviously the waiting list can still be years to get it. So what the state program will do starting next year, I think it's gonna be funded, I think it's at 15 million, uh, will be in next year's budget that will provide rental assistance for folks who are waiting for their Section 8 voucher to be able to get housed while they're on that waiting list. Michael. Uh, hello, Michael DeLong here from the Montgomery County Young Democrats. Um, there was a bill in the legislature this session which uh, a $15 per hour minimum wage to speed up the implementation of that and also to index it to inflation. So there was good news in that the power part speeding up the $15 per hour minimum wage passed, which is great, but it didn't automatically get indexed to inflation, which is bad. So. Um, what happened? Um, does this mean that we have to come back in a few years to raise the minimum wage again? And what can be done to ensure that all Maryland workers have a living wage? Uh, sure. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, first of all, it's good to see you. I used to be a young Democrat myself. Uh, I, uh, I want to just say that I share your disappointment. Um, but Sometimes in my day job where I'm an advocate on Capitol Hill uh, for disability rights and in my wonderful job representing all of you, you have to take half a loaf rather than a full loaf and that was the case because of the fact that um, the chair of the finance committee, Melanie, Melody Griffith, was not comfortable with the um, inflation piece uh, of the legislation. And so the bill came, and it was clear that, the, at least right now, the only part of the bill that was, going, that was going to pass the state senate was the part to accelerate the $15. So we were forced to take um, half a loaf. Uh, and so, you know, we have a wonderful senator, but it reminds me of the phrase that Sam Rayburn used to say, the enemy is not the House, uh, not Republicans, it's the Senate. So, but, 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 but anyway, uh, but anyway, so we just decided as a House, because of the chairwoman's concerns and different things, to take half a loaf, because it would still, still going to make a big difference, but I share your frustration. Yes. Hi, I'm Rachel Ripfo. I want to make two comments. One to the solitary confinement. To me, woke is about realizing for decades I haven't been seeing things right before my eyes where American citizens are losing their rights. And solitary is one. I'm a retired psychiatrist. It, there's no way that's good for any of us. And 15 days is still cruel and unusual. 
And, but you can't solve it unless you have an alternative. We really have to also fight for some other form of control within the prisons. We have to believe that people can help other people to be good. I think the Scandinavians have that. But we'll send you emails because it's really <laughs> a crime. And then I have a technical question for Senator Wallstriker from my daughter, Emily Beckman, which is a question about what's happening to the, I'll see if I can get it right, but to reforms in the way the juvenile justice um, system sort of works, where kids start out in the adult court and then can be sent back to juvenile, but there's a reluctance to do that because they can't be followed by adult probation officers once they become adults. And so if they've done something at 16 that you want to still follow them after 18, you can't do it. So could we start it the other way around and, and change the law so they can be on adult probation? Did I get it right? Um, I, I think so. Let me, <laughs> um, well, first of all, let me start with, um, it's wonderful growing up in this community and, and, and having um, been here. So um, Rachel's daughter, Emily, and I grew up together. We've known each other since the sixth grade. And coincidentally, uh, Emily married someone that I went to college with and knew separately. And it's just all these worlds colliding. And she's now my neighbor, as you are, Rachel. So um, thank you for that, that important question. So um, Maryland has made incredible strides when it comes to juvenile justice. Uh, and a couple years ago, we passed um, a huge Juvenile Justice Reform Act um, that integrated some of the ideas actually that Delegate Shetty had with in terms of age of responsibility um, and a number of important reforms to make sure our juvenile justice system um, is fair and um, treats people with dignity um, and is not just throwing uh, children away um, because children deserve the right to rehabilitation. They deserve the right to, um, to re-enter society. Well, that's true. Absolutely. No question. So um, the, the bill in question is about where some children start. So under Maryland's system, um, juveniles charged with very serious crimes, um, including uh, murder and carjacking, start automatically in the adult system and can be waived down to the juvenile system. And there's legislation that would change that. Um, it's a difficult lift in part because we are kind of in this um, uh, what can only be described as a, a sharp increase in juvenile crime. And we've seen that in our own legislative district. So there was a murder in the Wheaton Metro Station last week. This is the metro station I grew up in. My parents still use that metro station. Um, and uh, the suspect who's been arrested is a 16-year-old who was already well known to police who goes to Magruder High School um, and um, and will now, his, his life is obviously going to change very much. The, the, the murder victim um, will, you know, is no longer with us. And, and that murder victim's family, that, that family's life has been changed f forever. Um, and so um, it, it's difficult to reform a system when you have um, this very recent and very sharp increase. Uh, we have an, another example in Prince George's County. So my, my kids, um, just had their B'nai Mitzvah, they're 13. They actually had it relatively late in their 13-year-old year. They turned 14 in August. Um, I don't know if you heard, but um, a 14-year-old girl in Prince George's County ordered a hit on two rivals on a public school bus in Prince George's County. And um, a young man who was 15 went onto the bus to assassinate these two children. The gun jammed. He got away. Fortunately, the U.S. Marshals recently captured him, um, and he is now incarcerated. And so we see this kind of sharp increase, not only in, in the, the number of juvenile crimes, but the brazenness of juvenile crime and the violence in juvenile crime. Um, and so it's a real challenge when we kind of want to live our values as we should and must. Um, while also making sure our system is holding people accountable for their actions um, and centering the voices of victims in our community. So um, I think what you've seen uh, and what Emily has seen in our committee um, is a desire for, for some more of a hybrid system. So the, the, what we're bumping up against is if you, um, if you convict people in the juvenile system, they leave at 21, whether they're ready to or not. So let's go back to the example of the 15-year-old who ordered, 
two murders. Um, if, um, if she were tried in the juvenile system and convicted in the juvenile system and received services, the second she turns 21, she's out on the street again, regardless of whether we have any proof that the services worked and she is rehabilitated. And so what you see in my committee, and I'm sorry for this really long answer, it's an important issue and it, and it requires a little nuance, is how do we, is, is a desire for, for perhaps a hybrid system where people, people can start in the juvenile system, but there be some kind of assessment before release to ensure the person is safe to return to our community. Uh, what we're seeing in Baltimore, but also here in Montgomery County and throughout the state, is that um, the ma majority of serious juvenile crimes are committed by juveniles who have already previously been um, detained for other crimes, some serious, some less so. And so you see this kind of repeat effect and how do we find a system that is fair, respects the dignity of any, every individual, understands that children are children, while at the same time keeping our um, community safe and holding children accountable. So that's the push and the pull that we're, that we're working with. Yes, in the back. Thanks, Ina. Hi, this is Jerry Hickinson. Hi, guys, thanks for doing this. Uh, my first question is probably for Jared primarily. In your talk for the sec new Secretary of Transportation, are you discussing yet uh, the Beltway, I-270, the American Legion Bridge, and how can we get our local concerns and needs this time around actually taken into account? And my second quick question is maybe for Emily primarily. Uh, do you see any continuation in efforts to ensure that affordable health care and insurance is available to all folks in Maryland? Thank you. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Jerry. And, and yes, I think to, to answer your last question just very quickly, we all, I think we all agree with that. Um, and I'll let uh, Delegate Shetty talk more about the details. On the, the Beltway piece, so, you know, thanks to, frankly, the advocacy of many of you in this room and many other folks in our community, we were able to prevent what was, you know, only, I think what can only be described as a boondoggle and boneheaded uh, endeavor to widen not only the Beltway, but 270, um, which was, you know, give or take probably one of the top transportation priorities of the previous governor. Um, we were able to stop that. And, you know, Governor Moore has obviously pledged a very different process. Um, he was not left with a whole lot of really great options. Um, but I will say this, you know, so Delegate Corman, who I mentioned, um, you know, has now become the, the, the chair of the Transportation and Environment Committee. Um, you know, he was, we were fighting hand in glove, um, you know, to push back on, on the pieces that, that would have been incredibly detrimental to our community. He is now obviously, you know, responsible for overseeing, uh, you know, that legislation and that committee. Um, and I know he's been working closely with, with the new administration. We all have been talking with the new administration. Um, so has the county executive and the county council. Um, you know, they are trying to be as collaborative as they can be. I mean, Secretary Wiedefeld has still only been there probably about three months. Um, and they're kind of at the point where they've hired, secretaries were appointed, they've now appointed sort of deputy secretary, the, the assistant secretaries, and they're now trying to fill out the rest of their teams. Um, and actually I was, again, we were with uh, Secretary Wiedefeld this afternoon and some of his deputies talking about these types of issues. Um, you know, something obviously needs to be done. The American Legion Bridge needs to be upgraded. Um, but I think the process is going to be very, very, very different. And the outcome uh, is going to be very different. And no matter what the outcome is, it will not involve blowing up the community on our part, uh, on our part of, of the Beltway, um, you know, which would have just caused calamitous damage to Rock Creek Park. Um, and there's a, a lot of much more smart and immediate things that you can do on 270 where you do have incredible bottlenecks of traffic that were frankly ignored by the previous administration because in their rush to do for-profit tolling, they didn't make enough money. So never did they agree to touch sort of the parts of 270 where it turns into 70, where you have the biggest bottlenecks, you do have existing right of way and you know additional HOV lanes may be the, the goal or the key if you partner that with mark rail expansion, for example, that was never really on the table. So I think, uh, you can rest assured that the voices of Montgomery County that are, you know, that have been working closely with the community are in the room, working with the new administration to, to try to figure out what the solution is there. 
healthcare, my favorite subject. <laughs> um, so thank you for the great question, Jerry. So as, as some of you may know, um, Maryland um, has uh, considered a number of pieces of legislation over the last couple of years, uh, both to bring down costs in our healthcare system, as well as to expand access to quality health care. Um, and those are, uh, those are equally important, right? Like you can't, you can't expand access, but make it so unaffordable that nobody can actually have meaningful access. Um, and, and you can't do the other either, right? You have to have both. So, um, so several pieces of legislation were introduced this session um, that, um, that sought to do that. So one piece of legislation sought to enable all of our neighbors um, here in Montgomery County and across the state um, to be able to access our healthcare exchange. So our healthcare exchange is part of the is, is a very meaningful tool um, that people are able to access to purchase health coverage for themselves and their families. Um, it is subsidized by the federal government for, um, for people based on their income and citizenship. If we were to expand access to the exchange to those who are undocumented, they would not receive the subsidies However, they would be able to purchase potentially access to health care insurance, which they don't have currently. Um, and that's the right thing to do. And um, we had uh, a piece of legislation that passed the House. I think we had a lot of um, new members potentially on the, on the Senate side to the Committee of Jurisdiction for this new chair as well. Um, so this was a year one education bill um, for, for that effort. I do believe it will come back. Um, now that all of the uh, members are more familiar with the issue, um, it really is a win-win bill. Um, not only will it, is it the right thing to do, um, but it also helps lower the cost of care for everybody, right? If you're able to have more people covered on the exchange plans, then you expand the risk pool, which lowers costs across for everybody. So this is like a win-win proposal. So this is, this is something that um, I'm very excited about. I think it's a great piece of legislation. I do think it will come back. Um, there is separate um, uh, ideas percolating. There are separate ideas percolating that would expand access to Medicaid for, for the most low income of Marylanders to be able to access our Medicaid program um, regardless of their citizenship status. That is a trickier option, um, but a very, very important one for us to look into as well. Um, I, I think you know, we're gonna have to be creative about how we fund that because it will certainly be a significantly um, larger cost to the state, but I'm hugely supportive of it personally. So, um, so it's something that um, I'm working on this interim to research and dive into a bit more about how we can possibly get to that stage. Um, I think we have time for one last question. I haven't picked much from this side of the table. Anybody? Yes. Just had two comments. Um, my name's Lindsay Field. I'm a Kensington resident and also uh, co-president of the Noyes Children's Library Foundation. I wanted to say thank you. Sorry, thank you again for your support over the many, many years of fundraising <laughs> moving forward. Um, I'm also a resident of Connecticut Avenue, and we are still fighting for slower uh, speed rates on Connecticut. Uh, Emily was very instrumental in getting that. The whole team. The whole team, whole team, sorry. Okay. Was very instrumental in getting the speed camera added to Connecticut as you approach from Saul coming into Kensington but we would really love to have more speed measures made. And I think that goes across Kensington in general. Thank you. Um, so I'll start, but I'm sure others would like to share as well. Um, so uh, with the, uh, all of our team members are super coordinated on, on all constituent casework issues, but especially on pedestrian safety, especially on bike safety, especially on road safety. This is something that all four of our offices work really closely on and we spend a huge amount of time on it because we have a lot of state roads in our district. Um, and sadly, a lot of tragedies that have occurred on them throughout our district as well. 
Um, and so, um, uh, Delegate Solomon's office, actually Eden, um, leads us in quarterly meetings with SHA and the District 3 team here uh, to talk through hot spots throughout our community and different um, areas on, uh, on our state roads that need special, uh, special improvements made. Uh, we have a running spreadsheet every quarter plus. We do meetings in between as well. In fact, we saw them just this afternoon um, at an event with the governor, another pedestrian safety walk with the governor actually here in Wheaton. Um, and, um, and, and it is, it is something that we are extremely, uh, incredibly laser focused on. So um, on Connecticut Avenue, um, we worked really closely with SHA on a couple of improvements recently. So the uh, dedicated left turn light on Saul and the reconstruction of that intersection was a huge effort that we're really excited to have been able to, to make that happen in coordination with the State Highway Administration. Um, many of the recent tragedies that were happening at that intersection were in part due to people, um, what's that term called? Shooting the gap, where you're trying to like make it through before, like in between cars coming the other direction. So, so we believe that that intersection improvement will prevent significant tragedies down the road. So we're really excited about the work that was done there. Um, and then the speed camera uh, was another improvement that we worked with the Montgomery County Police Department and the local municipality that's, uh, that's there to, to make that happen. So we're super proud of that team effort um, along with the community. Uh, there are still a number of improvements needed along Connecticut, which is why our team worked closely with the State Highway Administration on the Connecticut Avenue Corridor Study, which some of you might be more familiar with than others, but it, it basically segmented um, Connecticut Avenue from uh, Chevy Chase Circle all the way till the University Avenue split into four different segments and identified um, safety improvements needed as well as the timeline for which those could be implemented. Um, some of the short-term projects have already been completed. I think they're working on some of the, the longer term and medium term improvements and with additional funds that we um, you know will be appropriating because of this guy on the transportation subcommittee um, we uh, we will hopefully be able to make some more movement on those necessary improvements to slow down uh, traffic calm traffic and make the road safer for the pedestrians and the residents that live there no um thank you delegate Shetty, and and um First of all, thank you for your advocacy on noise. My, my three-year-old Leo uh, probably spends more time at noise than, than any other place. Um, we moved to Kensington about six months ago, and, and that is like literally his favorite destination. Um, on the pedestrian safety piece, you know, as, as Delegate Shetty mentioned, a lot of those improvements, and I, I think, as you know, um, you know, we've continued to work with the State Highway Administration, particularly on the, on the Franklin Street issue, which continues to be a problem. And I think the last I saw, we're hoping either by the end of June or July, we're going to get an update on the study that they're looking at sort of the, the different configurations. And we've been working with the folks in Chevy Chase View and, and the town of Kensington on that particular issue and excited to see what, what the State Highway Administration comes back to us on. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the folks from the town of Kensington. and, and I think Councilmember Engel leads the pedestrian safety group. Um, you know, we've worked with the town. The town has been designated in this stretch uh, as a BIPA, a bike and pedestrian priority area, essentially, which opens up opportunities for, um, for the town to get additional funding, to get additional priority focus from, from the State Highway Administration and from MCDOT, the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, um, to do a lot of improvements because this whole stretch of Connecticut, um, you know, it, it's not only a safety issue for people walking, it has a huge impact on, on traffic. You know, we have an incredible uh, resource in the Mark Station, you know, half a mile away, and we hear from constituents all the time that they don't feel safe walking. They don't use it because nobody wants to walk. And, you know, we obviously don't want everybody in the community coming here and trying to park. We want people to be able to walk. That's one of the, the really wonderful things about, about our community. Um, you know, and, and Delegate Shetty mentioned this to somebody we were talking to as we walked in. You know, we sat down, Delegate Shetty and I sat down with he was west at that point with Governor Moore, um, you know, probably a year and a half before the campaign. And we were talking to him about issues and, and things that, you know, that we wanted him to be paying attention and things that we thought would resonate across the state. And one of the first things we mentioned to him was pedestrian safety. And, you know, it seems like a very local issue, but it is a, it is a concern in literally every corner of the state. You know, our roads were designed at a time when our state looked very, very, very different than it does today. Um, you know, you look at pictures in Kensington and this is a bucolic country road and now it's an eight lane highway. Um, and so, reconfiguring that 
is incredibly expensive, and our partners in, in county government have been doing yeoman's work. But um, you know, as Secretary Wiedefeld gets his feet under him in his new role, and new personnel comes into the State Highway Administration and to, to the Department of Transportation, it is a priority for the governor to change the way that we think about context on our roads, pedestrian safety. And so I think over the course of the next couple of years, we're going to see much more rapid pace of change to get the improvements that we, I mean, frankly, as Delegate Shetty mentioned, it is a long list. Um, you know, things that even if we had a billion dollars, we might not even be able to fund everything um, that our community deserves, but you're going to see a much different mentality from, from the Department of Transportation than I think we have over the last couple of years. Um, I think what we'll do is it's 10 of, um, we will wrap it up. There's still a little left time, little time left for pickleball. Um, <laughs> wanted to thank you again very much for coming out. And I also wanted to remind you though, the balance of this evening was about policy. Um, know that all of our offices are available to you for constituent work and for constituent if issues. Whether it is pedestrian safety, whether it's an issue with Washington Gas, WSSC, Verizon, MVA, um, make sure that you know that we are available, um, both staff as well as um, your members, and we are here to serve you. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you all very much. Um, they're gonna stick around for a couple minutes, so if you've got any um, specific questions you wanna to talk to them, please welcome up, um, up front. Thank you. <laughs>